the colorful interference pattern on a soap bubble can best be understood by thinking of light as a wave. On the other hand, the functioning of a photocell can best be understood by thinking of light as a particle. Can light be both a wave and a particle? Considerations such as these led Niels Bohr to set forth a principle of complementarity. His principle states that either wave theory or particle theory can be used to explain a particular light phenomenon, but not both. The principle of wave-particle duality is only one of the facets of quantum theory that we explore in this section. In 1900, Max Planck explained black body radiation with his theory that thermal oscillators have only discrete quantities of energy, rather than the continuous distribution indicated by classical theory. These discrete amounts of energy are related to the oscillation frequency and a constant now known as Planck's constant. This theory is known as Planck's quantum hypothesis, and the smallest possible oscillator energy is called a quantum of energy. Few, including Planck, were confident of the validity of the quantum hypothesis until 1905, when Einstein proposed a new theory of light. Einstein theorized that if the energy of molecular oscillators is quantized, then the emitted radiation must also be quantized. He conjectured further that light is transmitted as discrete particles, or quanta, rather than as waves, which can only be absorbed or emitted in whole units. Each light particle, known as a photon, has an energy corresponding to its frequency and Planck's constant. Let's estimate the number of photons emitted per second by a 60-watt light bulb. Assume that 10% of the electrical energy used by the bulb is converted to light. What is the light energy emitted per second by the light bulb? Correct. It uses 6 joules of energy in one second. Next, assume that the average wavelength of light emitted by the light bulb is 550 nanometers. How many photons are emitted per second by the light bulb? Correct. The light bulb emits a very large number of photons each second. During the late 19th century, scientists discovered that when light strikes the surface of certain metallic materials, electrons are emitted. This is known as the photoelectric effect. Classical theory could not explain several characteristics of the photoelectric effect. Einstein used the quantum theory of light to explain the photoelectric effect in 1905, and later won a Nobel Prize for this work. A photon of light has a discrete amount of energy that it can provide to an electron in a photosensitive metal. The electron is bound by attractive forces in the material, and as a result, some of the photon's energy does work to free the electron. The remaining energy goes into the kinetic energy of the displaced photoelectron. The maximum kinetic energy of photoelectrons varies linearly with the light frequency. No photoemission occurs in a material if the frequency of the incident light falls below a certain cutoff or threshold frequency. The photoelectric effect is used by a device known as a photocell. In one such device, a photosensitive metal is used as a cathode in an evacuated tube. By applying a voltage to the anode and cathode of the cell, the photoelectrons emitted by the cathode move to the anode and a current flows in the circuit. Today, most photocells in use are solid-state photocells. They have largely replaced the classic vacuum tube photocells. One familiar use of photocells is the solar panel, used for converting light energy into electricity. A solar panel is constructed of an array of photocells. When the light to the photocells is blocked, no current flows. When the light shines on the photocells, current flows. Increasing the intensity of the light shining on the photocells increases the intensity of the current. Photocells are used for many diverse applications. Automatic light switches that detect low light levels, photographic light meters that measure light intensity, 
smoke detectors that sense small numbers of smoke particles, and compact disc players that read the encoded music information on the disc. In 1923, experiments of Arthur Compton provided further evidence supporting the quantum theory of light. Compton observed the scattering of short wavelength photons, what we call X-rays, by various materials. He discovered that scattered radiation always has a slightly longer wavelength than incident radiation. Furthermore, he saw that the change in the wavelength depends on the scattering angle, but not on the scattering material. His observations, which could not be explained by the classical wave theory, became known as the Compton effect. The Compton effect makes sense only if photons act as quantum particles, colliding elastically with electrons in the target materials. In the 19th century, there was a great deal of study involving gas discharge tubes. Light from a typical incandescent bulb produces a continuous spectrum we view as white light. However, Light emitted by a gas discharge tube containing a single gas, such as hydrogen or neon, produces an emission spectrum containing only certain wavelengths of light. If a white light is passed through one of these gases, the resulting absorption spectrum lacks certain wavelengths of light. J.J. Balmer determined an empirical formula that predicts the visible spectral lines in hydrogen but no physical theory of the time could explain his findings. In 1911, Ernest Rutherford performed experiments involving the scattering of alpha particles by thin gold foil. He was surprised to find appreciable backscattering of the alpha particles, which could only be explained if most of the mass of a gold atom was concentrated in a minute nucleus with an associated positive charge. He also suggested that the nucleus of the lightest element, hydrogen, be called a proton. In 1913, Niels Bohr postulated a new theory of the atom in order to explain the Balmer series of hydrogen spectral lines. Bohr assumed that the hydrogen electron orbited the hydrogen proton in the nucleus in a circular orbit. He also made a radical assumption involving quantum theory that the angular momentum of the electron was quantized and could have only discrete values. The integer constant involved in his equation for the electron's angular momentum is known as the principal quantum number. Bohr predicted that only certain energy levels of the electron, depending on the principal quantum number, can occur. What is the energy of a hydrogen electron with a principal quantum number equal to 3? Incorrect. Try again. Incorrect. Try again. Correct. The energy of the electron is minus 1.5 electron volts. According to classical theory, an accelerating electron should radiate electromagnetic radiation. This would cause the electron to lose energy and spiral into the nucleus. This clearly does not occur. Thus, Bohr postulated that an electron moves in its orbit without radiating energy, and that an electron emits radiant energy only in the process of changing from one orbit to a lower orbit. The allowed orbits of the hydrogen electron in the Bohr model are commonly referred to as energy levels. The lowest energy level is called the ground state. Higher energy levels are called excited states. An electron must be given just the right amount of energy for it to ascend to a higher energy level. The energy necessary to completely free the electron from the atom is called its ionization energy. Normally, an electron in an excited state transitions very quickly to a lower state. When this happens, the atom emits a photon with an energy equal to the energy difference between the two levels involved in the transition. Therefore, only a photon with a specific wavelength or frequency can be emitted during a corresponding transition. The characteristic red light emitted by a neon sign is the result of a particular transition in neon gas. If an electron absorbs a photon and is excited to an energy several levels higher, 
It can return to the ground state by stepping down through the intervening levels and emitting a photon at each step. The emitted photons necessarily have lower energies and therefore have longer wavelengths than the original exciting photon. This phenomenon is known as phosphorescence. A fluorescent mineral excited by ultraviolet light glows with the emission of visible light. In some materials, when electrons are excited to higher states, they can remain in excited states for a measurable length of time before they transition back to the ground state. Phosphorescent materials are used for making the luminous dials of wristwatches. In 1924, Louis de Broglie reasoned that if light can behave as both a wave and a particle, then maybe a material particle, such as an electron, can also behave as a wave. He proposed that the wavelength of this matter wave is related to the particle's momentum, similar to the case for a photon of light. This wavelength is now known as the de Broglie wavelength. What is the de Broglie wavelength of a 5.0 kilogram bowling ball moving at 2.0 meters per second? Correct. This is an extremely small wavelength. De Broglie used his hypothesis to explain Bohr's atomic theory of hydrogen. Because the hydrogen electron travels in a discrete circular orbit in the Bohr model, the matter wave associated with it is a standing circular wave. This standing wave can only have an integral number of wavelengths. The radius of the Bohr orbit is thus related to an integral number of de Broglie wavelengths. George Thomson provided proof of de Broglie's theory when he showed electrons could be diffracted in a manner similar to light. Thomson bombarded materials with a beam of electron. The beam was scattered into a series of concentric rings, similar to the diffraction pattern observed for X-rays. Electrons can also be focused into an image like light waves. Because the wavelength of the probing electron is smaller than that of visible light, the scanning electron microscope provides images at a higher resolution than those produced by a light microscope. 